Recording in progress. All right, sweet. So let's get this show on the road. Um, today, I will hi, I'm Grant. There's like an introduction slide. We'll get to that, obviously, in the next one. Um, I'm going to be talking to you all today about judge adaption at NSDA National, because I believe judge adaption is like a super core tenant of debate, whether you're in Worlds or PF or Congress, obviously. Um, and NSDA Nationals is you know, like it, it's nationals, like, like it, it's important, it matters and everybody wants to get good ranks. Um, nobody wants to get dead last in their round, but somebody has to obviously. But um, yeah, so today I'm gonna be talking about judge adaption specifically at NSDA nationals. Um, a couple quick things, if you guys have questions or comments or anything like that, like you, that you wanna say when I'm presenting, you can either throw in the chat, you can unmute and just be like, yo Grant, I have a question. Um, it's really not that deep to me. Um, I'm not gonna be offended at all. And it's all about learning, right? So, um, yep. Or if you need to send me a private message for whatever, and you'd rather not have your name attached to it, I can just answer it as if it's like a random question. Um, but, um, before I get actually going into this, does anybody have any comments, questions, concerns, or anything they'd like to say or do before I get into the presentation? Um, there is one slide that asks for like engagement. It's not very hard and it's not a lot. I promise it's not going to be bad, but um, sweet. Barring, uh, barring anything else, uh, let's get going. So Judge Adaption and NSC Nationals. First off, I guess I'm just trying to talk about me. Um, again, hi, I'm Grant Davis. I use any pronouns. That means he, she, they, let it rip. Um, I graduated from University of Minnesota this past spring um, with a uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts in Spanish Studies and Political Science. Um, so yeah, so that's where my like academic interests are. I was a past competitor uh, from 2016 to 2019, so my sophomore year to my senior year at Egan High School in Minnesota. Um, I got to finals at Blake, Minneapolis, and TOC. Not finals at Nats. Uh, I got to out rounds at Nats and like Harvard. But um, I'll be honest, I didn't travel that much. Like I just didn't, wasn't really in the budget. Um, but yeah, uh, so yeah, I competed. I traveled on the circuit a little bit. Um, I did mostly Minnesota based stuff because they're Midwest based stuff because that's the easiest for me to get to and stuff like that. Um, I'm currently a Congress coach right now from 2019 from when I graduated to today. I'm coaching at nationals and judging at nationals. Um, at Robbinsville Armstrong and Robbinsville Cooper High Schools in Minnesota. Um, been coaching there, coached a bunch of national qualifiers, state champs, stuff like that. Um, I've judged hundreds of rounds, so that, that's not an exaggeration. Like, I mean, hundreds, plural. Um, I judge, I've judged like every weekend for all the seasons and stuff like that. Um, I've judged a bunch of online tournaments. Uh, I judged like finals at Harvard. Don't look at the ranks because apparently I was just a terrible judge in that final round. But um, I, I judge just about every tournament I go to. Um, I'll be honest, I've parlayed like I parley like 99% of the time and then I judge like 1% of the time. So I'm, I'm usually a parley because I have past experience and I like to think that I know what's going on. Um, at the bottom, I threw in, I'm a Pokemon aficionado. I promise you I'm a bigger Pokemon fan than you. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much who I am. I like to think that I'm, I'm, I'm on the lesser serious side of things in general. So I like to think I'm pretty approachable. So like, if you have a question of any kind, as I said earlier, drop in the chat, unmute, let it rip. I'm a big believer in just like, we're here to learn. It's best in like a learning environment where we're all speaking to each other if we need be. But if not, and nobody has any questions or comments or concerns throughout the whole presentation, cool with me too. Um, but yeah, so that's who I am. And now we can actually get into the actual presentation. So that was my quick little introduction. Now we'll actually get into the presentation. So first and foremost, I have a question. Throw it in the chat, unmute, do whatever. What is a judge? And at the bottom it says, I, I promise you won't get it wrong because like, I promise you, you won't. So just unmute or throw it in the chat, do something. Oh God, how do I access the chat? There we go. I mean, a judge, yeah, okay. Oh, I, damn it, or darn it. Pardon my French. I accidentally went to the next, I went to the next thing. I accidentally, oops, pardon me. Someone who ranks competitors in sides and round or preferably gives feedback. Exactly, right. You're 
all right and i didn't mean to switch slides but we did it so oh well we all survived we we will continue um a judge is a person ranks in judges speeches exactly correct yeah a judge is well all these answers are right it's important to remember that a judge specifically at nsda nationals is just an adult okay it is just an adult there are many many schools across the country that don't have great coaches or the coaches aren't available or they don't have chaperones. So they're just sending an adult to the tournament. The tournament, just like most other tournaments have like judge obligations in which they have to send somebody. This means that you're never going to have a judge does judge stuff. Thank you, Bella. That is facts. Um, so uh, a judge in this context at NSC Nationals is just an adult that they're sending, right? So that means that there's a very wide variation of what they're, of how they see around, of what they value in around, and most importantly, how they rank around. So it's really, really important to know that in just about any round you have, whether it's NSC Nationals or if it's a local or whatever, like you're not guaranteed to have like the perfect Congress judge. Which brings us to judge adaption, because it's really important to understand who you're speaking in front of and what they're kind of looking for. So I like to break it down into four different categories of like what the judges are. And I think these judges, these judge categories are most exemplified at, at NSDA Nationals because, okay, my boss works in the tab staff at like all the major tournaments. He's going to be at the tab staff at nationals. He's at the tab staff at Harvard. He's at the tab staff at TOC. He's just going to be there. So it's really important to understand that sometimes they can't make the perfect schedule work in a perfect world. Every single Congress round would only have like Congress specific judges who know the event, like the back of their hand, but that's just not reality because some people have different, some people have like different schedules, different availabilities, things like that. So it's really, really, really important to understand these four categories that I'm going to go over. Okay. And then we're going to synthesize what these four categories mean afterwards, just to give you guys like a rough idea of what's going to happen. Next. All right. First type of judge is a Congress judge. Okay. We all understand roughly what this means, but like they're likely a past competitor or a coach. Um, they know the game like they they can they're probably paying attention when people are caucusing they're probably paying attention to good parliamentary procedure they value all types of speeches they love reputation and this is one at the bottom that they reward good gamesmanship um, that's just because kind of up here like they know the game and see the round a little bit differently than like a than another judge that we're going to go over in a second um, they care about delivery at least a little bit Personally, not me. I just don't really care about delivery, but I understand I'm kind of an outlier in that. Um, but yeah, so the first type of judge, and I'm going to be honest, if you have like a Congress judge in every round, you're golden. You hit the jackpot because they're going to understand that you, if you're seeing the game and seeing the round on like a different level, they're going to be able to reward you for that in ways that other judges might not. Like when I apply this to like my judging philosophy, like I give my one to whoever the best legislator is. Like, I love reputation. It's my favorite part. But that doesn't mean that I'm just going to give you the one if you refute. Sometimes there are speeches that are just functionally better for the round and better for furthering the debate than other speeches are. This is because I see the round as a Congress judge, right? I'm a past competitor. I'm a current coach. And I like to think that I understand what goes into congress like just because you give a sponsorship speech like if nobody has a sponsorship speech and you give it i'm not going to mark you down because you didn't refute right like if anything i'm going to mark you up for getting the chamber going and for giving a speech um and also huge bonus points if you give the speech correctly right but um yeah so the first type of judge will be a congress judge the second type of judge. Parliamentarians are Congress judges. Yes, I would definitely say that. I would say, especially at nationals, like when you're a judge, so like in your tab room page, you have to go through and like check and fill out some things. So like I had to fill out how many years I've been doing Congress, like how experienced I am, how comfortable I am with parliamentary procedure. Um, I can't guarantee it. In general, I would say your parley is there because they're like the adult of the room. Like they really know what's going on. 
like the biggest reason I parley all the time is because I'm a past competitor. And like, if something were to go wrong, like if somebody didn't know how to do parliamentary procedure, it's way better that your parley like has an idea of what's going on just because so they can get the round going. So I would say your parley most of the time, especially at nationals is going to be qualified. Like it's going to be somebody who has experience in Congress, who knows parliamentary procedure and who is going to be an actual Congress judge. However, I would say below that, like these are kind of ranked in order based on how good I think they are for Congress. So following a Congress judge, the next judge we have is just a debate judge, EFLD, policy, world schools, parley, whatever it is, they, they judge debate, right? They might not judge Congress. They might not be familiar with it. They might not even like it, but that doesn't matter because if they don't like it, they're still judging the round, which means they're looking for things that are probably like from their zone, like from their, uh, I guess, origins almost. So they're looking for like complete arguments, right? That means things like a claim, a warrant, some evidence, an impact, like they're looking for the complete stuff in order to like give you good points. They're also loving reputation, right? Because that's, that's what they do. But just because they're a debate judge and they love reputation, that doesn't mean they don't value like a solid constructive and a solid summary. <clears throat> So like here I wrote constructives dash reputation dash summary. The general structure of a round, okay? When I say round, I mean literally just like round, like a Congress round, a PF round, an LD round, a policy round, a world's round. They're all structured like roughly the same. Constructive speeches go in the beginning. Then you have some refutation speeches to like hash out details in the middle. And then you have summary speeches. Like in PF, you have like your final focus. In LD, you have your second affirmative rebuttal. Like it's generally structured in the same way so for congress like that is like your sponsors your first negatives your like third fourth cycle speeches are your reputation like that general area and then your crystallization speeches so debate judges really value that type of stuff um delivery not that important to them um just because like delivery doesn't usually matter that much in other debate events um they're usually big val big believers in quality over quantity um just because they might not understand like the congressy implications of having research on everything and being able to speak on everything. That's just not as important to them. Um, they like it when you pick strategic arguments, like they want you to function in the debate round above all else because what they, where they come from is other forms of debate, right? So they are really building upon what they know, right? Which is debating and stuff. Um, then the next uh, type of judge we have, we have a speech judge, okay? They are a wild card, okay? Basically, good luck, have fun, if I'm being honest. A speech judge, not saying they're not, like, probably cool people and not, like, a fun time. That doesn't mean they're necessarily super qualified to judge Congress. Um, speech judges, I'm sure you guessed it, they, really, they, they view the round through a speech lens, right? They're very delivery heavy. They love those one-liners and those... Like, you care about money bags, I care about body bags. Like, they love that type of stuff, okay? They eat it up like butter. What's really important to understand is that, like, these people, like, likely don't want to be there. They likely got roped into it, and they're really just looking for their home, like, their home view, their origin being speech. Like, whether that's extent, it might be, if it's extent, that's great. Like, that's the best speech category you can probably get for Congress. But if you have, like, an oratory judge, like, good luck, have fun. Um, clarity is key, okay? This is going to be a common theme in my presentation that clarity and this acronym KISS, keep it simple, stupid, that's like a huge foundational aspect of judge adaption. Being able to understand that there is literally not a single judge on the face of this planet who wants to be confused. Like if I'm confused as a judge, I don't tune you out, but it makes it, basically impossible to rank you like if i don't know what the heck you're saying like why would i rank you that's just dumb and speech judges think that way a lot and it's really easy to confuse a speech judge right they don't know words like terminalize my impact they don't know things like constituent like they don't, probably don't know what constituent means if i'm keeping it a stack and like they don't fully understand or grasp congress the same way that like a congress judge would or a debate judge would because that's not where they come from 
they just don't. And then um, the very last type of judge that I would like to go over um, is, in my opinion, probably the worst type of judge you can have, and that would be a parent judge. Um, parent judges don't really look shout out to all my parents right like that's awesome that you're doing that and that you went all the way to nationals just to cover a judge obligation but they're usually influenced by just random subjectivity and, or whatever their kid tells them is good um generally speaking they love delivery and clarity like you can usually tell by their paradigms or they might explicitly say i am a parent judge um but this just like in speech judge i have that acronym kiss keep it simple stupid Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. Because when you have people who don't follow what's going on, again, clarity is key. They are just going to straight up drop you if they don't understand your argument because you use something like a weighing mechanism or you talked about like impacting to like the Iranian nuclear deal or something like that. They don't really understand. Like you're just straight up going to get dropped. Okay. So I have a I'm question. Gonna... Yeah, what's up? So in terms of weighing, like, because that's become one of an important part in Congress that I've noticed since like my past com um, competitions. But if we have a parent judge, how would you say making weighing like um, as clear as possible to them would be? Should we just like explicitly say, let's weigh the short term and the long term impacts against each other or something like that? I would say so. Yeah, I think that's a, a first of all, great question. I think it's like, I think there are ways to weigh like without jargon and like without like confusing people like literally phrases like this argument is more important than this argument. Like that's pretty impossible to misunderstand. And I think you're totally right when you say like, let's weigh short term versus long term. Like that's like a, a pretty simple way to weigh things. But when people are saying like, Let's weigh on magnitude. Like, I'm sorry. The random parent judge from Wyoming is not going to know what the heck you're talking about. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, before I move on to the next slides, I'm going to quick do a, a fire, just fire through all these judges again. Congress judge, past competitor, they know what's going on. Debate judge, doesn't fully understand Congress, but they like reputation and they like round structure. Speech judge is viewing what they see as valuable in speech and they're applying it to Congress most of the time like oratory or humor or whatever. So, um, and then you got the parent judge, which is the wild card. There is something that we're gonna talk about in a second. And basically, if you can understand that at any given round you're in, whether you're in prelims or whether you're in finals, and I'll explain why I'm including finals in this context, whether you're in these rounds, you could have any of these judges at any time, especially in prelims, okay? The way judging like obligations work at nationals, it's really weird, okay? So I'm from Minnesota. At no point in the entire tournament from prelims to finals can I ever judge a kid from Minnesota. That's just in the rules at NSA nationals. I'm not allowed to judge anyone from Minnesota. Wisconsin, sure. Illinois, go for it. I can judge those kids. I can't judge Minnesota kids. That means like... Okay, not to throw anybody on the spot, but there's some states that are just a little bit better at Congress than other states. Like, I'll be honest, Minnesota holistically is just not as good or developed as like Texas or Florida or California or New York. Like these states have a very large Congress presence and they usually have a ton of qualifiers because their districts are enormous. That's just like how it goes. It's not, not good or bad. It's just, that's just the way it goes. Like, I'm pretty sure like Wyoming is sending like six people in congress total and my district in minnesota is sending like eight like it's just different states have different structures because i can never judge somebody from minnesota that means as you get to the farther out rounds and the kids from like the big circuit schools with the really developed really rich programs when they are in your round that means you're not going to have like the odds are you're not going to have like a florida congress judge right? Like the people they send, you're probably not going to have like the explicit Congress judges that come from those states. So in finals, if you look back at all the previous tabs and stuff like that, there's usually a judge from like Wyoming or Alaska or like 
South Dakota or places that don't have like super, super developed Congress programs because I guarantee you right now, I would bet all the money I have, it's not a lot of money, but I would bet it all that in the final round, there's going to be at least one kid from Texas, at least one kid from Florida, at least one kid from California, and at least one kid from like the Upper East Coast. Like that's just like how it works because these these programs are very developed and they have great coaching and they're just good at Congress, right? That means if there is one Texas kid in the final round, you can eliminate all Texas Congress judges. They are not allowed to judge that round. But if there's like, again, like it goes vice versa. If there's no Texas kids, that means you can have Texas judges. But the way it usually works out, like just about every year for the past like bajillion years, like there's going to be kids from good schools in the final round. So that's why judge adaption is so, so crucial. So between a Congress judge, debate judge, speech judge, and parent judge, they all come from somewhere. And there are rules and obligations that they have to be able to cover. Do you have a question, CJ? Yeah. So for parent judges, it's like a difference between just a parent judge who, I don't know, maybe they're a stay-at-home mom or a parent judge who's a full-time lawyer. I would say, yeah, there is a difference, but like, I think the harsh reality is that like even full-time lawyers like well don't get me wrong i'd rather have a full-time lawyer than like not a lawyer as my judge in all honesty but like it's i think it's still fair to say that they are assuming they haven't judged a lot of rounds they haven't judged a lot of rounds like maybe they have and i'm just completely wrong and there, there are anomalies of parents who just love to judge but like at Nats, it's mostly just going to be people who are traveling with their kids because their school only qualified by two kids. Um, I would say there is a difference, but the same logic kind of applies, with like clarity and stuff like that. You can also, um, I talked about it at the very end, but paradigms are like mad important. I'm being so serious. Before every round you have, I'm assuming everybody knows what a paradigm is, but if you don't, that's cool. I'll quick go over it. A paradigm is what a judge is looking for. It's available on tabroom.com. You'll get a tab blast before your round, like, oh, Grant Davis, you're in round 216, and your judges are John Doe and Jane Smith. Like, and then you can find their paradigms and read through them. When you read through them, that's when we can do our adaption. But you're probably all asking this question. Okay, this is a lot of information. When are we actually going to talk about adaption? So, Grant. What do we do with all of this? I'm so glad you guys asked. Find the LCD, okay? I'm being so serious about this. If I had my old legal pads, I would show you. At the top of literally every single speech I gave in my entire career, I wrote the same three things at the top of my paper. Two of them are important, but one of them I wrote was LCD and I would circle it. Lowest common denominator. That is like the key to judge adaption. Now, I'm assuming everybody is familiar with like the mathematical implications of lowest common denominator. If you're not, here's a quick little pizza thing. Um, you know, one sixth and one fourth is really hard to add, but if you find the common denominator being the bottom number of 24 by multiplying these two, it's really not important. Just one sixth and one fourth is hard to add, but four twenty fourths and six twenty fourths is really easy to add. Basically, that is the logic all judge adaption is finding that common ground that people are truly going to be able to receive and understand regardless if they're a speech judge, a parent judge, a debate judge, or a Congress judge, because there are some things that are just seen as like universally good. So basically it comes down to like this. I didn't know this picture was this grainy, but we're going to rock with it. So um, basically, it's like this four-way Venn diagram, right? I place it in this order because I think, well, it's kind of impossible to place it in the correct order because it ends up with debate and parent next to each other, which is hilarious. Um, but yeah, so basically what, we're, what you should be shooting for is this gray area in the middle where you can appease to Congress, speech, parent, and debate judges at any given moment, right? Because it's super important for you to be like well-received by all the judges. If I'm being honest, a little secret, it's not about going straight ones. It's about making every judge's ballot and making it pretty high. Like if you look at final rounds of any tournament, like I'll use Harvard as an example. I judged Harvard, okay? The PO won Harvard. I give them like my seven or eight 
right? Like the people who win never like I mean they do, but like generally speaking, they don't ever go like one, 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 two, two, one, two, one. Like that's just generally not how it goes. And usually it's the kids who make every ballot and make it relatively high. How do you do that? It's by appeasing the people who might not be the best judge in the room. It's about finding these lowest common denominators and applying them in a way that is digestible for all forms of judges. So moving forward, I have just a list of attributes, okay? I understand some of them contradict each other. It's supposed to. But yeah, like free speaking, you know, like the speech judges are obviously going to love that. Complete argumentation, like debate judges are really going to take note of that. Round engagement clash, debate Congress judges, nice questioning, aggressive questioning, extemporaneous delivery, prepared speeches. Like you guys can read. I know you're all fully capable of that. So it's really important to understand that these attributes can all be preferred by different judges, right? So what I would like to like basically do and explain is how we can find a way to touch all of these bases without just like completely changing what you know about Congress and without like completely changing exactly like what you do and how you do it and stuff like that. So I think it's really important for us to understand also at the very far right, I have these two, quality over quantity and quantity over quality. I'm gonna touch about those, touch on those a little bit more specifically um, once I get to that slide, obviously. Um, sorry, my notes just disappeared, so I need to pull them back up. Oh, God damn it. Okay. All right. God, my Wi-Fi in my apartment is super garbage. So you have to give me a second. Okay. So um, all of these attributes are like really important to understand because as I've said, I'm a broken record. Judges like different things. Like they're judging your round. There is going to be at least a little bit of subjectivity that dictates how they view a round. So, but it's really important for us to actually like boil this down. Okay. This is the slide, oops, this is the slide I'm gonna spend the most time on. And this is where I would, ex like, if you have questions, again, unmute, let it rip, just go crazy on it. Um, I think it's really important for us to understand this slide more than the other slides, specifically because it's like actually how we're gonna be doing things. First, confident speaking, okay? I'm gonna be honest, I was never like the prettiest speaker. I just wasn't okay i was never like super pretty about it i was never like i never had all the rhetoric as all the other kids i was never like as fluent of a speaker i was more of a debater um but honestly like you can get by and appeal to all four judges by just speaking with your chest okay there are some phrases that i teach my students that i coach that i like honestly like live by in terms of my debate coaching philosophy and Right or wrong, debate it strong. You guys can figure out what that means. You're all, you're all big, smart kids. So basically, when you're speaking and you're giving your speech, I'm assuming you guys already do, but if you don't, make sure you're saying that crap with your chest. Like, you are dictating the round. You are saying what you need to say, and you are saying it confidently. If you speak confidently, because I can tell you right now, there are going to be kids in your round that don't speak confidently. There just are going to be, especially in prelims, okay? So when you're, if you have a speech judge or a parent judge who really cares about delivery, like probably not good, but they're going to value your speech and it probably listen more than they would for the other speeches because you're speaking confidently, because you're like truly delivering and speaking to them. And I'm gonna be honest, it's hard to teach like good, pretty speaking. Like sometimes it's just hard. Like sometimes people have speech impediments. Sometimes people have trouble focusing. Like it's not that deep really, but it's easy to teach confident speaking because shocker, these people who you're gonna see at nationals, odds are they're not gonna be like, they're not really gonna care, TBH. Like they're not really gonna be too pressed about like, who you are and what you're doing they're more worried about themselves and they're more worried about how can i get to the next round right it doesn't matter if you don't appeal to like your colleagues or whatever your peers in the round the people you're debating with 
that straight up does not matter at all. It only matters that like the two judges in the back of the round and the parley are listening to you and they're following you. Like even if every single kid in the round hates you, like that doesn't matter. If the judges love you, then the judges love you. Like peace, see you in the next round. Maybe I won't. Like it's really important to understand that like if you speak confidently, you're getting you're way more likely to get these parent judges ballots and you're way more likely to get the speech judges ballots. And even if you're like a like a great flow debater and you or you love your weighing and stuff like that, like content wise, thumbs up to you. Shout out you. That's awesome. If you can't speak confidently, parent judges and speech judges, boom, tuned out. Don't care. It's not good. It's not that they should be doing that, but that's just the fact of the matter. Um, the next phrase that I teach my students is I did clean it up a little bit, but just because we're on a recorded presentation. It's know your crap or know your crap, okay? There's two different yours here. I'm sure we all understand what's going on here. Basically, just like be knowledgeable. Like, this parent and speech judges and the debate and Congress judges are going to be able to tell if you're BSing, right? Like, it's kind of easy to tell when somebody doesn't really know their crap. Um, so I know it's like a little bit of a weird thing, just like be knowledgeable, but like, I just mean like, do research, be relatively well read. Um, oh, also side note, forgot to say this in the beginning. Um, I coordinate like Congress materials and stuff like that. Um, I We're gonna release a brief for nationals. It's gonna be free. Um, it's just gonna be prelims and then house quarters and Senate SEMS as of right now. I'm trying to get the next round, but it's all volunteer work. So I'm not sure that's gonna happen. I'll talk more about that at the very end. But um, there will be free research out there for you guys if you need it. Um, back to the stuff. Um, so yeah, this whole idea of like know your crap or know your crap is applicable to all four judge archetypes, right? Being knowledgeable and speaking confidently is appealing to all four judges, okay? I'm gonna talk a little bit more about paradigms um, in the next slide, but... Um, yeah, being knowledgeable and speaking confidently is is good for all four judges. And also generally just good for life. Like speak confidently, like say your crap, you know, say that with your chest, own that stuff. I'm a big believer in that. Um, next, complete and simple argumentation. I'm assuming everybody here is familiar with the complete argument. Like you got your claim, you got your warrant, you got your evidence or whatever you want to call it, different schools call different things, and you got your impact, right? If you're like not misunderstood, you're hitting these parent and speech judges ballots, right? Like, I'm gonna be honest, I'm just operating this presentation under the assumption that you guys are at least a little familiar with how to hit Congress judges and debate judges ballots. I mean, you're going to nationals, I would assume a lot of us are, um, or you have interest in getting better. Um, and there are plenty of other presentations offered at this camp that are that can also help you with that. But um. You can't be misunderstood by anyone if you have complete and clean and simple argumentation. It's really, really important to understand that. And I think, like, in the, I'm actually going to piggyback this on to the next one. The next one I have is clean reputation. There are, actually, clarity, we'll get onto that in a second. Like, clean reputation and clarity, clarity, clarity go really well with clean and simple argumentation. Like, I know it sounds like really elementary. Like, Grant, obviously, I know to be clear. Like, I'm not stupid. I obviously know that. And I know you guys know that. However, um, more often than not, people think they're clear and they're actually, they're clear to callers judges, they're clear to debate judges, but that's not who we're talking about. We're talking about parent and speech judges who are super removed from this event and who are super removed from forensics. Um, so, like, when it comes to clean reputation, I think that like we had a question earlier, but like, how do we do really clear weighing? First of all, I think you eliminate debate jargon unless you like have checked the paradigms, you know they're gonna understand you. Um, facts, iPads, the blue in the chat, that's facts. Um, okay, so uh, basically like when it comes to like clean reputation, like they say X, I say Y. Like you can't be misunderstood. Not be, like if you are, if you, are misunderstood. I know I've said it a billion times. If you're misunderstood, you might as well kiss those ballots goodbye because they're just not going to vote for you. Um, and also, if you have like this clean, clear reputation, it sticks out. Like, if you have like any debate judge, 
is going to value one good reputation over like 10 name dropping. Like, I think a really, 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 really bad habit that exists in Congress is somebody will be like, Representative Davis said this decreases jobs. However, I have a different source that says it increases jobs. Then they'll just like read that card. I think that's probably bad debating and isn't necessarily a real reputation. But if you have like clear warrant level argumentation or link level argumentation and reputation, that's going to stick out to these debate judges. And also, if you're clean and clear and crisp, the parent and speech judges are going to love it. Obviously, the Congress judges are going to love it either way. So good on you. Um, but yeah, not being misunderstood and this whole phrase of keep it simple, stupid, like, you know, kiss is really important, honestly. Like, you just have to be understood. That is a prerequisite to every single speech you give is being understood by everybody. That's what I love about this event is that anybody can walk into a round and understand what's going on. As opposed to policy, as opposed to LD, as opposed to PF. These events aren't necessarily as accessible as I think Congress is. Sure, there's still jargon and stuff, but clarity is key. And clarity is what's going to get you these ballots that are, you maybe wouldn't have been able to get in the past. Okay, and on like the clarity thing, I leave this as a critique every single time I hear it. Um, phrases and like little roadmap markers okay in other events it's called signposting it's basically when you're in the middle of your speech and you say like now we're going to get to the impact or now we're at the links like just to keep everybody on the same page as you because again clarity is key there's phrases that you can use that are super super beneficial across all four of the judge archetypes that we were talking about earlier this is important because the impact of this is this is this outweighs or this is more important than the opposition side because what does this mean in the context of the round like these questions you can ask yourself or statements you can throw in these are the bread and butter because if even if you think you're being clear as day if you lose a parent judge or a speech judge they're going to need they're going to be looking for a way to get themselves back on track because that's just what they do that's what any human does. When you get lost, you look for a way to get back on track. So what I think is really uniquely beneficial about these types of phrases is the fact that like anybody can understand them. And they're beneficial because debate judges see it as signposting. Congress judges see it as signposting. Speech judges see it as, oh my God, thankfully we're back on track. And so do, and so do parent judges. Like sometimes people just get lost or sometimes people just tune out. I'm going to keep it a stack with all of y'all. These rounds get long. Like, sometimes people just be tuning out. Like, that's just kind of how it goes. And, like, keeping people on track is an absolute necessity. It's a prereq to everything that happens. And uh, why is this, like, super applicable to NSDA nationals? Because, as I said earlier, you have tons of different judges. There's, like, like if you go on tab room, there isn't even like a split Congress section for judges yet. Like it's just like policy and then like main is like what it's called. And there's just like a thousand judges in there. Like the way it is right now, I'm assuming it's going to change by nationals, but yo, it's coming up. Like they haven't changed it yet. Um, it's really important to understand in nationals, so like your judges can be very differently experienced and very differently like geared at understanding things like i'm gonna be judging at nationals oh yeah the very real chance i end up as one of y'all's judges i mean like i, I could at some point like that's definitely a possibility just because i'm gonna be judging at nationals and i'm they're probably gonna put me in out rounds just because they do every year um yeah it's like my fourth time judging nats and they have me in the final rounds like every year it's, doesn't change my pay but it changes how much free time i have so that's a whole thing um yeah, so um, basically, like, if you can understand clarity, 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 you're golden. Like, if you're going to take nothing from my presentation, if you haven't been listening, if you're just thinking of the recording, if you're, I don't know, doing whatever or whatever, clarity is key. That is what you always need to have. And the final thing I have on this slide is quantity and quality, okay? That sounds like the dumbest thing ever, like... Oh, well, obviously, I'm going to speak all the time and be really good. Like, thanks, Grant. I really appreciate that. 
But like, if you can use these strategies and apply what you already know and just speak on everything, you're golden. I can't believe this is a standard that has to be like, like there've been multiple times where I've seen kids like just choose to not speak on something. That tells me, and that tells most other judges that you do not have for you do not have prep. You are not ready. And like being prepped is a prerequisite to everything we do. Like you can't speak on things if you don't have prep. Um, but if you do have prep or if you do have a free research brief that helps you out in prelims in the first couple out rounds, then you can actually speak on everything. I don't know why you wouldn't. Like I un okay, I understand there are instances where it's like, okay, we have one AF and 10,000 negs and all the negs are in the same row and the AF is like racist or whatever. Like there's definitely instances in which it's not good to speak on bills. I get that. I'm not trying to disqualify that as being a very real result of debate. However, those instances, not that common. Let's just be honest, not that common. And with the bills that have been picked, like I've looked through them. I've run practice rounds with my kids and other kids in Minnesota. Like there are arguments out there on these topics. And like when in doubt, like you can just go up there with your flow, like boom. If you've been flowing, like boom, that's your speech. You are ready. You can go up there as long as you speak confidently, you have complete and simple argumentation, clean reputation, clarity, and you're speaking, you are good. I wholeheartedly believe if you speak on everything, question like decently often, question all the time, and you're not like a complete and utter just jerk, you're going to be hitting the ballots of all four of these people. Because again, you don't know who's really going to be in the back of your round until like five minutes before. That brings us to the one of the very last things I'm going to bring up before I get to the next slide. I don't know if anybody gets nervous interrupting people. I don't know about y'all, but I do. I'm gonna leave like a couple, like a minute or so. Does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, anything? I'm not seeing anything in the chat, but if you want to unmute now and not interrupt, now's your time. I have a question about um specifically like the fourth one, because in one of my ballots, I've gotten some judges saying that they don't tend to prefer rhetorical questions. Like, what does this mean for the round? Or how does this change anything? So I was just wondering, would it be better to do a statement or just a question? Or does it just, doesn't matter regardless? Personally, I think it doesn't really matter. Like it wouldn't change how I view the round. Um, I think both are valuable. Um, I think, I mean, if, if you're concerned that a question is bad, then go for a statement. Because I think they're functionally like, if they're not the exact same, they're super close in similarity. Like, as long as you're keeping us on track, because that's all it serves as. It's just like a nail on your sign posting, just like, all right, here's where we are right now. Like, if you would rather just do a statement, that's totally cool, too. It's all about just keeping people on track. Do I think the judge probably cares too much about the format of your sign posting? Yeah. But, I mean, like, that's another thing. Like, judges sometimes care about really weird stuff. Um... And as and it seems that that judge who left you that comment may have been, yeah, a little quick to, I mean, I don't know, that just doesn't seem that important to me. Like, I, that's just so removed from me. I would never leave a comment like that because that seems silly. Um, but I would say, personally, it doesn't really matter. But if you want to just do, like, statements instead, also works completely fine. Okay, I'm just going to do questions. It's so much easier. And I also have another, <laughs> yeah, I have another question about ref too. Um, I know this is a problem because I've seen it in most of my speeches, but in terms of whenever you're like refuting someone else, is it more you try to prove why their argument works and then you bring in the evidence to back it up? Or do you simply just like use your own statement rather than bringing in evidence too? Or it just depends on what the context of the round is. I think it does depend on the context of the round. But if I'm being honest, I think the best way to appeal to the masses is to like, sure, anybody can bring up contradictory evidence. Like I could find evidence on the internet right now that says the sky is red. Like that's just how it works now. But 
being able to logically disprove it without evidence, I think is really, really important. Like engaging with the warrants or engaging with the links, like just being like, yo, this doesn't happen because in the world of the app, automation inevitably goes up. This is backed by this evidence. Um, I think it does matter in the context of the round, which is kind of a crappy answer for me to give. But um, I think it's good to be able to like, explain why the argument doesn't work or why the argument does work and then back it up with evidence as opposed to just reading contradictory evidence. Being able to like logically disprove, I think is super important. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, ooh, someone's in the chat. Nope, it's just Nick. 10 minute warning, dang. Okay, so yeah, we got like 10 minutes left. Anybody got any uh, other questions before I move on to the next slide? We're wrapping it up, I promise. Uh, I have a question. What's up? Uh, she can go first. Thank you. Um, so for refutation, would you say it would be a good or a bad idea to include like positive refutation? Like in the past, I've said like representative so-and-so makes a great point and like adding it on to my point or do you think it's just not necessary? Are you saying like somebody on your side? Yeah, on my side. Yeah. Like they say we say, but it's on my side. Um, I think um, in general, I would, because like debate judges like really hate rehash, as long as you stay away from like just repeating the same thing they said, like if you have positive things to add, like if you're being genuine, like I think too many people will be like, oh darn, they have the same argument as me, but maybe if I say I would like to add on to it, nobody will notice it's rehash. Like I think there are real and positive ways to add on to points. And I think they're very good. Um, it's really, I think it's, it's good to do. The short answer is yes, I think it's good to do only if you're like fully adding stuff because too many people just like repeat things and be like, but I added on, so I didn't rehash. And which is just not how it works. Like if you're positively adding, you're, I think that's a good thing to do. Sweet. Any other questions before we get to the next slide? Uh, yeah. So you talked about like a lot about the judges. Should, do you recommend we ask for paradigms at the beginning of our rounds? Before I get to that, that's what my next slide is about. So I'm gonna answer that one in like a minute or so. So great okay. question. All right, anything else before we get to the last little thing we're gonna talk about? Sweet, awesome. So the very next thing is the important tips for finding out Who's in the back of your round? Um, paradigms, 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 paradigms. We all, I think we all know what a paradigm is, but if you don't, I talked about it a little bit. They're on tabroom.com. It's this little blue thing right here. Like here's mine, Grant Davis, Robinzo Cooper. You just click this, the little like thing, and it brings you to a paradigm and it'll have a bunch of things on there about what they're looking for. However, really important to note, like let's scroll down here. Grant Davis has a paradigm. JD Davis has a paradigm. Matthew Davis has a paradigm. Megan Davis does not have a paradigm, okay? There's a lot of implications one can make from this. They're not always right. Like, I know plenty of qualified, okay, not plenty. I know a few qualified judges who just don't have paradigms. More often than not, if I'm a betting person, I'm betting that the person without a paradigm doesn't know what the heck is going on, or they aren't very experienced in it. Again, that's not the one-all be-all. That's always how it is. But um, checking for checking their paradigm, and if they don't have one, I think it's safest to assume they are a parent or a speech judge. Because in speech, there's not a ton of paradigms. There are paradigms, but it's more common to not have a paradigm. And then in, a parent judge like, just set up their tab room account yesterday. Like, they don't know what's going on. Um, you should always check their paradigms before round. Um, also, the average judge is totally totally okay with being asked about their paradigm however most people like if they have a paradigm like it bothers me when i have a full paradigm that has a bunch of stuff on it and people will just like ask me yo grant what's your paradigm and it's like well my paradigm exists and you can go look at it but like you can ask specific questions about the paradigm like if you click on my paradigm you can see like at the top it has like my my qualifications what I like to see broken up by event because I judge a lot of different things. Um, 
not a lot, in all honesty, just policy, LB, PF, and Congress. Um, but uh, you can check out these paradigms. I would say, like, if you're presiding, you should, instead of asking, judge, please, can you please share your paradigm? You should say something like, hey, judge, is there anything you'd like to say before we get the round started? Um, if you don't, like, if your PO doesn't do that, you can, like, be like, hey, PO, quick question. Should we ask the judges if they want us to know anything? Because I think that's fine. Like, I think asking for paradigms is fine. It might bother some people, but not to the point where it's going to affect your ranks or even, like, the perception of you as a debater. Like, it's so common in debate to ask for paradigms. And, like, it's nothing. Like, if you need to ask for one, ask for it. You can do that in front of the round. You can do that one-on-one. -on -one. Like, if somebody came up to me and said, hey, like, just a one-on-one -on -one conversation and said, hey, what are you looking for in the debate round? I'll answer that kid's question. And whoops, now only that kid has that knowledge and they get rewarded for asking. But getting the paradigm is really important and reading a paradigm, like, what you should do when you open a paradigm, if, you, if they have sections, get to the Congress section. If you have time, read everything because everything they have in their paradigm is a perception or a preconceived notion that they have, which means you can apply different things. You can find out who they are. If they say in their paradigm, I've been a speech judge for 25 years. Okay, they're a speech judge then. If they say, I'm, my kid does this, whatever, that's a parent judge. You can just comb through these paradigms. Paradigms are really important for finding things out and getting to the bottom of who you got. If you need to ask, just let it rip and So now I have pretty much completed my presentation. My email is on the screen if you have further questions because we've only got like three minutes left. Um, but if anybody has any questions- uh, I just have can... one quick question. Yep, let it rip. Okay, so where do we find that uh, judges list again? Um, so if you go here, I'm gonna stop sharing real quick. If you go to tab room, uh, go to tabroom.com and then go to the national tournament, which is like, I'm pretty sure it's like right on the top. Yeah, national speech and debate tournament. Okay, come on. And then you'll, there's a judges section. And then right now, normally it's broken up into like Congress, PF, LD, but right now it's only LD policy and then main. So it's not gonna be super helpful because there's 2,339 judges in that section. Um, but Ideally, mm -hmm. when you get your pairings, you should be able to either click on the judge and click on their paradigm directly from there. Or if you can't, you're going to have to go through the main list and like organize it by last name and then go find them. But I, I can't stress it enough. Reading paradigms is like vitally important and it's pretty easy to do at the tournament. Um, so yeah, you'll get okay. the Do you recommend we do it before we go to the tournament or... Uh, like at the tournament before rounds i would i would say honestly uh i would say don't i just impossible to read right now because there's like over two thousand paradigms um i would say it's best to do it at the tournament before the round like the split second you get your tab like text i would mm -hmm. say immediately go straight to the fans like screw who's in your round who cares that doesn't matter what matters is appeasing the judges um then you, i think you should just go straight to the judges Mm -hmm. I also have a question about that research thing. What is it called? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I totally forgot about that. Here, I'm going to drop some in the chat right now. Um, okay. Everyone. Uh, okay, so I'm going to drop. So here is, I dropped our Instagram. I dropped our Institute and our website. Website hasn't been updated in a minute. Um, that's where I put out most of my like stuff about it. Like I'll be in contact with the equality and forensics people about it. Cause they're probably going to blast it out too. Cause free re resources. That's cool. Um, I'm looking to have it out this week or at least partially some of it out because it's impossible to have like the whole thing, you know, it's impossible to coordinate everything and get the whole tournament out. Um, but, uh, we released briefs in the past. Um, so like there are other, like in the brief that I'm going to release this week and on the website, mm -hmm. um, you can find our briefs that have other stuff for like 
our old research. Like we, I think total we're at like 350 pages of research that have been put out in the last two years. And I've got a bunch coming out this year. Um, but yeah, just keep an eye out for that. And you'll probably see stuff on Instagram. If you don't have an Instagram, we have a website. Also my email, I'm going to put in the chat one more time. Um, I'm, you can just contact me. It's really not that deep. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so there's, I'll have stuff out hopefully this week is what I'm crossing my fingers for. We've got all prelims done. Um, it's all volunteer work, so it's kind of hard to get people to do it. But um, yeah, sweet. So that's kind of how that works. Any other questions? All right, sweet. So assuming there are no other questions, um, thank you all you guys for being studious and not just, you know, I appreciate y'all. Um, questions you can shoot me in an email you can dm the instagram if you want in all honesty i'll respond i'm the only one who runs it um yeah so sweet thank you guys so much have a great day y'all and if you're going to nats good luck uh, maybe i will see you there um yeah sweet awesome thank you guys so much appreciate it thank you thank you for thank you so much room or something thank you thank you thanks for the lecture grant that's very cool um as for the labs you all can just head back to where you were beforehand because